through this, this um, three-year research project that I did, which you can see on MeganBowler.net, Rethinking Media, Democracy, and Citizenship. Um, uh, I'm just going to jump to some of the lessons that I learned in those three years. One is what I mentioned before. There was, um, so one of the things that I studied was how people were attracted to, the focus of that research was what are the motivations of people who produce blogs or produce videos that offer alternative accounts to mainstream and corporate owned media, particularly with and in relation to questions of, of war and social protest, as I mentioned before. So there's a whole lot to be said about that research, and I don't have time to say that. But what, one thing that I learned is if you have complex um, findings, so for example, when we looked at how people were attracted to The Daily Show and why people watch The Daily Show or how they use that in their own production or how they use parody, etc., it was very difficult to figure out how do we make this a little soundbite package that I can send out and get the news to pick up? Because at the same time as I was doing this kind of nuanced work with my collaborative team, there were studies some of you may have seen called um, uh, a study in uh, that talked about the daily show effect, and they coined that term, the daily show effect, and the claim was from a really poor, poor methodology that when young people watched The Daily Show, they became cynical and apathetic and were less likely to vote. I mean, this was insane. I just couldn't believe it. And if you go Google that, you will see that that got picked up by every wire. It just, it, it just was disseminated so widely. And there wasn't even a way to counter that, which reminds me of another big challenge that I think we face, and that is that once information is out there, as we all know, once story of weapons of mass destruction is out there. It's so strange, the psychology of human nature, that no matter how much evidence we can show to counter the, the myth or the misinformation, um, it's, it's just this insanely uphill battle. So smear campaigns are very effective, misinformation is very effective, and when you counter it, you only get X percentage, and it's extremely frustrating. So similarly with the Daily Show effect, not only is it difficult to get nuanced studies out into the public sphere, but it's very difficult to counter um, poor information. Megan? Yeah, I have one minute left. Yeah, bless All right. Um, so, the other really important thing that I learned from this and is that how young people in particular, but actually most people who are engaging with, um, with social media in all of its forms, that we need new conceptions of political citizenship and even new alternatives to what we've known as democracy so that uh, you know, the fact is that young people are not talking about what they're doing in terms of my Obama or whatever. Um, they're not talking about that as civic engagement or um, political participation. They don't necessarily see it that way. So I really had my eyes open in terms of what counts as citizenship and what counts as civic engagement and how are we going to name it. Just really briefly, I think that the power of Remix is incredible. And one of the reasons that The Daily Show is as powerful as it is, and that it's not just a throwaway, is that it actually uses footage that we don't have in a public archive. We don't have public archives of television news. And the fact that now, with digital streaming, we have, you have something like The Daily Show, well, we have access to streaming of, of news online, but to be able to capture it and repurpose it is incredibly powerful. And talk about, you know, when my critical media literacy in times of war had to use text for the news to show side by side, here's this version, here's that version, one of the most powerful forms on The Daily Show is when he uses, um, you know, Rumsfeld talking in 2004 and then 2010 and contradicting himself. So finally, I just um, have some flyers up here about this book, um, Digital Media and Democracy, Tactics in Hard Times. And what I wanted to say about the lessons from that is that I'm so glad that I had a vision that I wanted to figure out how to not have just a scholarly book, but a book that talked about how digital media was changing the landscape of journalism and how I could talk about that from, invite people to talk about that from really different exper um, backgrounds. So whether it's scholars, or whether it's activists, or in this case, journalists. Um, we, I interviewed 
uh, Bob McChesney and Amy Goodman and Hassan Ibrahim from Al Jazeera. I think that that kind of diversity is withstanding the test of time, or so say the um, review. So finally, just to sum up, um, the only point here that I didn't touch on is this first one. Um, how do we also counter this idea that this current generation is a generation of slacktivists, that, it's, uh, that activism has turned into an online click and point and um, sit in your armchair? I think that's really inaccurate, and this is an example of a media message that has gotten out, and to figure out how we can counter that requires, I think, the, the <coughs> collaboration of activists, of journalists, and of scholars to figure out how we can convey through the media the fact that social movement is happening, but it's happening through forms of identity and citizen identity that doesn't look anything like the nostalgic portrait we have of the 1960s activists, but that it is happening. And the extent to which we think that it is not happening is largely due to the fact that mainstream and corporate media does generally does not report on it, and that that's part of the erasure and mystification that makes it appear that social movement protest is not happening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Megan.